Over on Jaguar Gatorade, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about a player on the BYU football team in 1994 who almost died and somehow played the next week and had one of the best games of his career. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. September 16th, 2002. It's week two of a brand new NFL season, and we have a big NFC East game on our hands over at FedEx Field between Philadelphia and Washington. Aside from the obvious divisional rivalry aspect of the game, and aside from the fact that this game was nationally televised on ABC on Monday Night Football, which automatically raises the stakes, this felt like an absolute must-win game for the Eagles. After losing 27-24 to the Tennessee Titans in Week 1, Philly was now playing a 1-0 Washington team, meaning that if they lost this game, not only would they drop to 0-2, and not only would they have a divisional loss on their hands, which could be huge with tiebreakers down the line, but they would be two games back of the division lead already. Plus, you just don't want to be 0-2. Since 1999, in the last three years, of the 18 teams to make the playoffs in the NFC, none of them were winless after the first two games. In other words, if the Eagles wanted to avoid being in this early hole, then they needed to win this game tonight. No doubt about it. They needed to go into FedEx Field, stick it to their division rival, and put on a show for the whole country to watch. What followed was an absolute massacre, which would be the last time that Philadelphia ever went into FedEx Field on Monday Night Football and destroyed Washington in a completely uncompetitive contest. After the first quarter, each team had two drives. On Washington's two drives, they did nothing. On Philly's first two drives, they score two touchdowns. Can't do much better than 14-0 after two drives. By halftime, thanks to three field goals by David Akers, Philadelphia was leading Washington by a score of 23-7, with the game looking like it had the potential to be a complete runaway. When the second half opened up and Donovan McNabb hit James Thrash on a 39-yard touchdown pass to make it 30-7, it seemed like we were getting ready to turn out the lights and call this party over or at the very least, start wrapping it up. And when Dorsey Levins punched it in from 47 yards out in the fourth quarter to make it 37-7, it was all but wrapped up. As a side note, to learn more about the career of Dorsey Levins and another crazy game he had on Monday Night Football, click the card in the upper right corner. To say that this game was a blowout would be an understatement, as oftentimes, it didn't even look like the two teams belonged on the same field. Philadelphia had 22 first downs compared to 11 for Washington, meaning that Philly doubled Washington's total in that regard. In terms of total yardage, it wasn't even close, as Philadelphia outgained Washington 451 to 179, recording more than two and a half times their yardage. Whereas Philadelphia played a clean and error-free game of football, turning it over no times, Washington did not do that, turning it over three times. Whereas Philadelphia converted on nearly 50% of their third downs, going 7 for 15, and doing a great job extending drives and keeping them alive with their backs against the wall, Washington did not do that, going just 3 for 12 on third down, converting just 25% of the time. And the Eagles' pass defense was superb all night long, as Washington's starting quarterback Shea Matthews got replaced midway through the game after going 10 for 22 for 62 yards no touchdowns, and one interception, completing only 45% of his passes, and finishing with a passer rating of 33.5, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. This was in the era where Monday Night Football games started well past 9 o'clock on the East Coast, and this meant that when Levin scored that touchdown to make it 37-7 midway through the fourth quarter, it was past midnight. In other words, when you have two East Coast fan bases playing in a highly uncompetitive game that is super late, a lot of people are going to be turning the game off to get some sleep and to get ready for work or school or whatever they have to do the next day. Fans at the game may leave early to beat the traffic, people may turn off the game to watch other late night programming or go to bed, you get the idea. The point is that most people in the country were not watching the game by this point. They didn't exactly see how it ended. And when they woke up the next day and saw the news and read the headlines, 
they couldn't believe what they missed out on and what they were reading. And it had nothing to do with the on-field action. This wasn't a Monday Night Miracle situation like the Jets-Dolphins game two years before in 2000, where the Jets were down 30-7 entering the fourth quarter and somehow came back to win. The final score of this game was 37-7, so whether you stayed up for the whole thing or turned it off right after Levin scored his dagger of a touchdown, you missed nothing in that regard. Rather, it had to do with one of the scariest events, and maybe the scariest event, considering the times, in the history of Monday Night Football, where many at the time thought that a terrorist attack was taking place. Because this is the story behind the absolute chaos and pandemonium. With seven minutes left and Washington facing fourth and seven in their own territory, knowing that this game is over, they opt to punt the ball away. Brian Barker punts it 46 yards, and Brian Mitchell gets a huge return of 49 yards on the play to completely negate the purpose of the punt, and then some. As is typical with many changes of possession, the broadcast went to a commercial break, as an official timeout was taken to stop the play. By this point, a large portion of the stadium had emptied out, but somewhere behind the Eagles' sideline, a fight between fans was breaking out. And it wasn't a fight between two or three fans. Apparently, there were a fairly large number of people involved in the altercation. Now, there's no footage available of this fight, but the fight got so bad that one fan was helplessly on the ground and was being kicked repeatedly. When an officer tried to stop the fight, he was unable to do so, probably for a variety of reasons, from the fact that there were too many people involved to the fact that it's unsurprising that the people involved would not be immediately compliant, seeing as it's late at night, it's mom mentality, and they could have alcohol in their systems. At this point, with a fan being beaten up and kicked, completely defenseless, and completely unable to fend for himself, the unidentified officer involved from the Prince George's County Police Department had to make a decision to stop the fight as quickly as possible, use as minimal force as possible, and save a man's life, since one kick to the head is all that it takes. With that, the officer decided that the best way to stop the madness was to use pepper spray. Now, the legality of pepper spray itself in police departments, and whether police officers should be allowed to use it, especially since pepper spray is classified as a chemical weapon under the Chemical Weapons Convention in 1993, and since it is a riot control agent and is banned in international warfare, is another debate entirely that I'm not going to comment on, since I'll be going way off topic, and I'm sure that there will be some heated and lively discussion in the comments section about that. And keep in mind, for those who are unaware, pepper spray, though supposedly non-lethal, is highly dangerous and hurts tremendously. Getting hit with pepper spray is no laughing matter, to the point where an ACLU report from 1995 reported that 26 people died in a 30-month stretch from police officers simply by being pepper sprayed. But in Washington, D.C., even though many efforts across the country were made for pepper spray usage reform and restrictions, it is completely legal for anyone to have pepper spray, let alone a police officer, even though no fan would ever be allowed to bring pepper spray into a stadium. And when the officer deployed his pepper spray, the fight came to a halt. The mob of fans fighting was quelled, and most importantly, the fan who was laying helplessly on the ground in the brunt of the fighting had his life saved. As the police department said afterwards, the officer made the decision to deploy the pepper spray to quickly control a potentially dangerous situation with the minimal force necessary to assist the spectator in trouble. The action was taken to safeguard the well-being of all nearby spectators. Again, we don't have footage of this fight, so it's tough to definitively say, especially with the benefit of hindsight and not in the heat of the moment, whether the officer made the right call. However, the officer who made the call was not reprimanded. So the fight was broken up, which was the good news. And if this fight took place in the 200 level, or the 400 level, or took place in the 100 level behind the end zone, then while it doesn't impact the severity of the fight by any means, and while this fight would still be a larger and more abnormal fight than other ones, then it wouldn't be too much of a national story. 
but because it took place behind the Eagle's sideline, where the pepper spray was deployed, it was done so just a few feet from where many of the Eagles players were standing. And when you combine that with the fact that the Eagles had cooling fans on their sideline to help the players cool down, especially since it was a relatively warm night being 76 degrees a kickoff, you can probably see where this one is going. Because parts of the pepper spray traveled in the air, then got redirected by the cooling fans and hit the Eagles players. And when that happened, as you can probably expect, it was a complete nightmare. Linebacker Ike Reese immediately went down and started throwing up. Other players felt a burning sensation shortly after Reese did, and by this point, any players who weren't impacted were running across the field to Washington's sideline, which was completely unaffected by this. Players on the Eagles legitimately thought that they were going to die. I should note that there was one player on the Eagles who did not feel this way, because he had his back turned to the field initially and was watching the fight go down in the stands. So he saw the whole thing unfold with his own two eyes and knew exactly what was going on. That was cornerback Troy Vinson, who said, I happened to see the fight in the stands. I saw what happened. I saw the police use that spray. But for everyone else, their mind was on one of two things. The first was that they were going to die. The second, this was a terrorist attack. Remember, this was only a year after the events on September 11th. There was still a ton of fear surrounding the controversy that a terrorist attack could occur at any moment, especially with large events. And this fear was especially true with NFL games, where at Super Bowl 36, just about every item under the sun, from foam fingers, to backpacks, to camera cases, to noisemakers, were banned, and where checkpoints were set up so far away from the Superdome to illustrate this fear, even despite all these protective measures, to the point where the Super Bowl was designed as a national security special event, CNN held an interactive poll that asked whether or not they thought that a terrorist attack could happen at the Super Bowl. And with over 68,000 votes, the majority of the people at the time voted that no, tight security like this couldn't prevent the Super Bowl from being hit. This was still a relatively new post-9-11 world. So now, factor in a primetime football game in front of a national television audience in the nation's capital with a chemical that was causing people to drop like flies, couldn't be seen, and where no one outside of Troy Vincent knew where it came from, and it makes complete sense why people thought at first that this was a terrorist attack, and that this could have been anthrax. Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie said, I had no idea what was going on. The first thing you think of is some crazy attack on innocent football players. It was very scary because you had no idea. The lack of knowledge. I just saw people coughing and bending over. I couldn't explain it to myself quickly. Tight end Chad Lewis said, Everyone got onto the field, and I heard someone talk about anthrax. That's when I said, Whoa. Here we are in Washington, D.C. And who knows what might happen here? It's midnight. And who knows what's going on in the stands? When both teams were on the field, I was thinking, this is crazy. Let's get out of here. Even tackle John Jansen, who was on the opposing team, was worried and wasn't concerned about the game anymore, thinking the worst. As Jansen said, if that had happened before last September 11th, you would have thought nothing of it. We've all been in stadiums where the crowd gets out of hand and the police have to do stuff like that. Now, you don't know what it is. Especially in this area, you're just not sure. And other players on the Eagles, if they weren't thinking about it being a terrorist attack, were thinking about being able to breathe again. Two players, linebacker Ike Reese and defensive end Michael Sinclair, needed to be treated afterwards, with Reese saying, I just started choking. I didn't know what it was, but I could tell it was something I was inhaling. I was fine as I was coming to the sidelines, but then, once I got there, it seemed like my lungs started collapsing a bit, and I started gagging. You could taste it. I was scared that I was going to choke to death. Wide receiver Todd Pinkston echoed those thoughts, saying, It's scary when you can hardly breathe. There was a burning sensation. And defensive end Andy Kalu said, 
it just sneaks up on you, and then bam, you've got tears in your eyes, and you don't know why. It was scary, just because you didn't know what it was. Fortunately, after about eight minutes, the effects of the pepper spray on the sideline for the Eagles were gone, and it was safe for the Eagles to return, with referee Bob McElwee resuming play now that the coast was clear, and now that we had a pretty good feeling that it wasn't a terrorist attack anymore. But for the final six and a half minutes, the game took on a completely different feel. For those six and a half minutes, it wasn't really about the game. It was about just being fortunate enough to be alive, knowing that your life might have flashed before your very eyes. It was about just wanting to get out of there as soon as possible. There were 11 plays run afterwards, with 9 coming from Philly and 2 coming from Washington, and all 11 of them were runs. They just wanted that clock to run and for this nightmare to be over. Even if you thought that the threat was gone, it was always going to be in the back of your mind. How could it not be knowing that you're in D.C. and not even being 12 months removed from the worst terrorist attack on American soil? It was a truly scary sight for everyone involved. In the hundreds upon hundreds of games ever played on Monday Night Football, there have been a ton of bizarre moments that still feel weird to comprehend all these years later. But no moment has ever been scarier than this one, where people thought, and understandably so considering the context of the country and of the world at the time, that a terrorist attack was taking place in the middle of a game. If we're lucky and fortunate, we'll never see another moment like this again, because regardless of what team you rooted for on this night, just about everyone had that same feeling of dread, fear, and terror when they saw this unfolding right before their very eyes. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.